Now we're gonna talk about my absolute favorite of our three main food preservation techniques, which is, <coughs> pardon me, the hostile environment. You make a hostile environment by uh, quite a variety of things. You make a hostile environment by including in your recipe something that is a byproduct of microbial growth and therefore a poison because it's excrement. So for example, acid um, or other fermentation products also make a hostile environment. You can use salt to make a hostile environment. You can use sugar to make a hostile environment. And you can use, huh, what's going on here? You can use the absence of water to make a hostile environment, which comes back to my all time favorite concept from both thermodynamics and food science, which is water activity. So let's talk briefly about fermentation. You've experienced a number of fermented foods before, or probably at least heard about them, such as this magnificent list of foods and many more. Not all of these are really about preserving vegetables. Uh, up here, that list uh, is about vegetables. And there isn't really a reason you couldn't do it with fruit. For example, pickling lemons is a thing people do. Uh, this is often more of a cultural choice or has a significant comp component of cultural choice. Because pickling foods uh, involves salt and also uh, sitting in fluid and an acid for an extended period of time, you usually need to start with something that has a substantial texture that won't completely fall to mush under those conditions. And that's probably a, a, a reason why pickled strawberries aren't so much of a thing, because they're kind of soft to begin with, and then also a preference because uh, some foods are just felt to go better in a more savory context, and some are felt to go better in a sweeter context, which again is a very cultural thing. So how does fermentation work? Fermentation is, you can think of as inviting uh, desirable microbes to colonize a food. And those desirable uh, microbes then keep this from spoiling because of a few things. First off, competition. We have seeded so many of the desirable microbes into this space that the uh, other stuff that happens to just wander in that we don't want there, it just can't compete. It can't grow to an appreciable extent because all of the food and all of the resources are going to the microbes we put there on purpose. The other thing that happens is these desirable microbes are munching on the food and they are putting out metabolic products, i.e. wastes. And the wastes that they're putting out are things like acids. So you can think about lactic acid in uh, pickles and say yogurt, or you can think about ethanol, which often we talk about as alcohol in the case of say beer and wine. And these metabolic products are poisons. Yeah. Uh, and you say, wait a minute, poisons? That's bad. Poison is bad. Well, uh, think about this. The reason a, a product, not a product, the reason a waste product is a waste product is because the living organism needs to excrete that in order to continue to live. So when, for example, we make beer, we put yeast in with a uh, grains and sugars that it can happily munch on, and it munches and munches and munches until it has filled the uh, vat with so much of its own uh, waste products that it can't survive anymore, and neither can most other things. And that's what makes beer alcoholic, and also what makes beer uh, a reasonably safe thing to drink from a microbial contamination perspective. So <clears throat> we are after those metabolic products. There are things that make metabolic products that are poisonous to us too. And in fact, you could not, uh, you and I could not live on pure acid or pure ethanol, um, obviously. Uh, but in moderation, we can, uh, we can consume these things. And so it renders it somewhat safe. So this is why it's uh, important here that we have the right microbe is what's growing. It's not just any random thing that turns pickles 
into nice edible pickles. It has to be the right sort of microbes to uh, generate the waste products that we find tasty and also safe. And there are a variety of processes to make sure that you get only the right things into your mix. Uh, these go from uh, what you're perhaps used to, where we have in the case of beer, wine, bread, uh, soy sauce, yogurt. We uh, start by killing off the microbes that might naturally be there, and then we add stuff ourselves. We make sure we have the right yeast, for example, uh, or the right fungus in the space. Uh, or we make the conditions hostile to everything but the right kind of microbe. So we salted this uh, uh, cucumbers to such an extent that only the proper halophiles can live there, and those are the bacteria that we want. So there you go. That's the quick overview of fermentation. There are other videos on fermentation that I invite you to watch to learn a little bit more. Fermentation takes a long time. It takes uh, days, two weeks, two months even, to produce a truly well-fermented product. And when uh, bacteria and yeast, you know, the microbes we're using in fermentation, uh, do their bit, they don't just produce the acids and the alcohols that we think of as the main uh, preservation power, they produce lots of other things that have flavors. And so compare and contrast, say, the flavor of yogurt to the flavor of pudding, which has many similar components but doesn't have that acid tang or that more complex behavior. Sometimes in a food product, we just want to skip all that either because we're looking for a simpler, cleaner taste, or we're in a rush. And you can see how both of these things would be important uh, in an industrial setting. So rather than fermenting your cucumbers uh, into pickles, you can just go straight to the metabolic press products. And in that case, you can uh, add flavors and a whole bunch of vinegar to a jar of pickles, process it in the uh, heating canner to make sure it is sterile, and you have bread and butter pickles. Um, that also works with ethanol. So things that you don't want, so no fermentation flavor, uh, and it turns out that is often a distinction uh, culturally between American palates and those uh, of uh, some foods that you would find elsewhere in the world that uh, Americans are often commercially looking for a simpler and more straightforward flavor profile than uh, in their, especially in their processed foods, than you might see elsewhere. So sauerkraut, kimchi might be uh, less popular uh, commercially than something that uh, is more Un, is unfermented but preserved in a uh, similar way, such as maybe um, just taking that cabbage and having it served with vinegar as like pickled cabbage. So no fermentation flavor and faster processing. You can also achieve uh, much of the same effect with what we call uh, preservatives. So things like benzoic acid may or may not, in fact, in this case, is a chemical preservative, preservative did not um, typically arise in fermentation, but it achieves that same end by uh, poisoning at a low level many of the microbes that we find undesirable and dangerous in food. Uh, and it does that while at the same time not appreciably poisoning us the uh, humans that are eating the food. And so there's a, a kind of limited set of chemicals in a very limited set of concentrations that are allowable for this uh, purpose. And so let's take another quick visit to the FDA website and check that out. So the best place to look for this is what's called the generally regarded as safe, G-R-A-S, grass list. Uh, this is a summary list that captures much of that information. But as you see in this disclaimer right up at the top, uh, this is for quick reference and to see the full um, 
status of what's going on, we should look in the code of federal regulations and see the, the fully described regulations. But um, I want you to get in the habit of, of going to this website and looking around. And I want you to see that this, again, is a rather complex document. So we have a, a number of different types of chemicals that are on this list and food sources. So things that are emulsifiers or enzymes, fungicide, hormone. At the moment, we are going to be looking for PRES, chemical preservative. And because this is an exceptionally long list, I am going to use the jump to to get us down to B. You can see some of the interesting things that are in here, stuff that you are familiar with, you've heard of, you know, like basil, doesn't seem like anyone should find basil to be challenging, and then stuff that is quite firmly, <clears throat> everyone would agree, in the chemical camp, camp such as benzene, which uh, really <clears throat> you don't eat all that often at all. And that's a good thing, you shouldn't. So here we find, right in the middle, uh, benzoic acid. And what does this mean? So press means it's a preservative, and then GRAS, generally regarded as safe, um, but only if we are using it at this level of concentration. So that's not a whole lot. Um, and as is the case, uh, as I've mentioned before, when we are using preservatives, fermentation, uh, water activity control, we're almost always doing that in concert with at least one, if not both of the other methods of trying to kill all the microbes in the first place and trying to keep them in a very, very clean container. This doesn't work on its own. It works best as something that is preserving, maintaining the status of some of a food that has already been rendered uh, uh, safe through heat treatment, for example. Now it is time for my favorite concept in all of food science and thermodynamics, which is water activity. And water activity is written A sub W, A for the activity, W for the water. And why is this such an important and awesome concept? Well, let's uh, spend a moment and look at how cells work. So here's a cell, and as you probably know, uh, the cell is mostly water, right? You and I and plants and animals are all mostly water on the inside of the cell. Now, uh, cells uh, for the microbes that we care about generally have uh, what's called a cell wall. You and I don't, but uh, it's got this kind of uh, helpful structural element around it. And that's important because when we drop this cell into some surrounding fluid, uh, there is a water activity that describes the water inside the cell. And then there's a water activity. So I'm going to call one sub C and sub S. So sub C for in the cell, sub S for in the surroundings. So uh, why is this important? Well, water moves from high water activity to low. So, for example, if you have uh, out here in the surroundings, you have uh, pure water. So that's a very high water activity. That's the highest water activity you can have is one. <laughs> that's pure water. So high water activity out there in the surroundings, and then the cell has stuff dissolved in it. So it's going to have a water activity uh, that is, I wrote that wrong, a W less than one. And so what'll happen there? What will happen is the water will try to go from outside the cell to inside the cell because water moves from high activity toward lower activity. And that's, um, that's all well and good. That seems fine. Uh, but you'll notice what happens when something starts filling into something else. Well, 
uh, there's there's kind of two consequences, one immediate, one eventual. This wall, this membrane, the uh, envelope around the outside of the cell can hold what's in the cell up to a certain pressure, right? Uh, it can, so you imagine it like a balloon and you're filling the balloon to make a water balloon. If you've ever filled the balloon to make a water balloon, you know that that balloon can hold some amount of water kind of up to a certain pressure, up to a certain weight. Um, pressure is force over an area. So the outside of the balloon is the area. The mass inside is creating the force under gravity. And at some point that gets too high and the thing just explodes. Or if we have it the other way around, so let's imagine this is going a different way around. So we're getting rid of the pure water um, and we're gonna say it's salt water. So at a lower AW, and so our cell still has an AW less than one, but uh, it's higher than here. Now, all of a sudden we reverse these arrows and water leaves the cell. And that uh, is fine up to a point, uh, and then you exceed the pressure difference that the cell wall can tolerate, and you end up with shriveling the cell shrivel like a raisin, um, and drying it out, making it unable to uh, complete its cellular functions anymore, essentially killing it, or at least deactivating it. So does that sound cool? So that the, the idea here is um, all cells can maintain some difference in water activity between interior and out here, outside. Uh, and that's key because if that wasn't able to happen, nothing would actually live for very long. Um, you would touch bath water and explode. Fortunately, that does not happen. So we can all maintain uh, some discrepancy. But if this discrepancy is too large, if you make the water activity of the surroundings too low, and low is what we're shooting for here, uh, then cells cannot survive successfully in that environment. So how do you lower water activity? Well, water activity is approximately, see the star of simplification, I can uh, work on that simplification for you if you like, the molar concentration of water, and uh, specifically mole fraction. So it's kind of a version of the concentration of water, but not how we normally think of concentration. We've got to think about it in terms of moles. Now remember, moles are like uh, just sort of, uh, if, if it's been a while for you for chemistry, Think of a mole as number of molecules. So you've got to count up how many molecules of water are there. So it's not the mass of water, it's the number of molecules of water. And the reason this is important is because, if you remember, here's water, H2O. Uh, and then if you think about the other things that are in food, such as sugar. Drawn on the same scale, sugar is going to look, you know, like this relative to water. Even a food that has a boatload of sugar in it still often has quite a lot of water uh, if you are counting by moles, because it just takes 18 grams, so like three teaspoons of water, to get a mole of water whereas it takes um, <laughs> hundreds of grams to get to a mole of sugar. So you've got three teaspoons of water against um, a cup of sugar, just about. And so uh, there are um, lots of things have water activity that is very high, even though when you look at it, that thing, whatever it is, you don't think, wow, that's wet. Let's do an example. So a strawberry has about 138 grams of water 
in 158 grams of strawberry. And what's that other stuff? That other stuff we call is starch, fiber, sugar, a tiny little bit of protein, a tiny little bit of fat. Mostly we're talking about uh, sugar, fiber, and actually a relatively small amount of starch. And if we turn this all into moles and work out the mole fraction of water, we end up getting a mole fraction of water, which I'm going to say is about the water activity, of 0.99. That is, on a molecular basis, a strawberry is 99% water. If we quickly look at a table of how various microorganisms are able to survive at various water activity, we find that uh, the vast majority of the nasty microorganisms that we are worried about in spoilage um, are capable of thriving above a water activity of 0.85. And you probably know this if you have uh, kept strawberries around. They do uh, eventually go fuzzy because, well, they're mostly water and the microbes are quite happy to live on them. By contrast, let's, uh, let's take a look at what happens when we make jam. In making jam, you add sugar. In fact, uh, quite often you add double the mass of sugar as you added of the strawberries, and you also remove water when you are boiling. When I made jam, I worked this out and I had 2,224 grams of jam, and of that, only 516.8 grams was water. Again, convert to moles, and this works out that now my water activity is about 0.85. And 0 0.85 is pretty much the magic number. So if we look again at this table, citation at the bottom, you see that once we start getting uh, below 0.85, it's uh, some molds, a few molds and a few yeasts are capable of living. Once you start getting into the 0.7s, almost nothing is. So if you take this jam, uh, which is now hostile to the worst stuff. You process it in boiling water, which kills any remaining uh, spores and microbes that might have survived the cooking, and keep it sealed. It should be st shelf stable for quite a long time because nothing is there in the first place, and if anything should happen to get in, it's un it should be unable to grow. And that is the magnificent power of water activity, and it is why uh, we can have things like potato chips, which have very, very low water um, uh, content, and they last uh, a very nice long time relative to, for example, the original potato. I have several other videos on water activity that I'm putting in this playlist. I hope you will watch all of them. This is an interesting uh, exercise to go through. Something you will discover as you work on this. Two things. One, the FDA has specifications on water activity, so it's not something people work out from scratch every single time. Uh, those specifications on water activity are in part what dictates the recipe of what goes into a can or a jar. So that's one. Um, two, you discover that simply removing water, just boiling something or cooking something till its water activity gets down to an appropriate level uh, is very difficult it's a lot of water that you've got to take out. And that is why most of the time when you find something that has been dried, it's not only dried, but it's dried and salted or dried and sugared. Uh, and that is because when you put in salt or sugar, you've introduced other molecules to the system that take the place of where water could be. And that drives the water activity down lower uh, more easily than the amount of cooking time uh, or drying time it would take to get to something that is truly dried without being sweetened.